At Kelly Companies, it is no secret that they believe in the power of people. In an effort to help their Keelians get to know each other a little bit better, they decided to launch the Who Do You Know campaign. The goal was simple. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at keelycompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. You are in for a treat today because today's guest proudly holds many amazing titles, including wife and daughter and mom and neonatologist, reality television star, cancer survivor, best-selling international author, yet at her core, she's just trying to live her best life while doing the best she can to serve others around her. For 14 seasons, Dr. Jennifer Arnold, that's a name I'm sure many of you recognize, alongside her beloved husband, Bill, starred on TLC's hit docudrama, The Little Couple. It's on that show that they courageously shared their life journey to starting a family and the daily challenges that they faced each and every day. Today, Jennifer shares how she's overcome numerous life challenges with optimism, including dozens of childhood surgeries related to a rare type of dwarfism, what inspired her to become a doctor, how she treats her patients, how she's faced a devastating stage three cancer diagnosis, the adoption of a child, then a second child, and then the life they had going forward. It's an amazing story. You're in for a wonderful, wonderful conversation with one of my favorite people. So my friends, this conversation that you are about to hear is one of hope, and it's going to remind each and every one of us that when life gets difficult, and it will, that there is reason for hope, that the foundation is indeed firm, that optimism still matters, and that the best is yet to come. To guide us into that conversation is my friend, and now yours, her name is Dr. Jennifer Arnold. Jennifer, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you so much for having me, John. Oh my goodness, it's quite quite an honor. Well, uh, lower expectations, but here, 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 here we go for the, for my honor, which is to bring you onto our show. I'm going to begin with just a, a few titles: wife, mother, daughter, author, reality television star, board certified in both pediatric and neonatal medicine. Currently working at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard University as a program director. On and on and on and on from there. So here's my question. If you and I bumped into each other in Boston at a coffee shop and I said, hmm, Jennifer, tell me about you. What would you say? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I feel like I wear all of those hats, but we all wear so many hats. I would say that I'm just a girl from Florida who's probably a little lost in the cold, living the best life that I can, trying to enjoy every minute and do as much good as I can with what I've got to do. Uh, you are living every minute about as incredibly as you can. You're doing a ton of good work. We're going to be celebrating that work today. So we'll, we'll hop on a plane. We'll leave Boston. I promise we'll come back to it in a moment. But let's go down to Florida. It's where I used to vacation as a kid. It's where you grew up. So rather than talking about the state of Florida, let's talk about the parents who raised you in Florida. They were young when they had you. Talk about mom and dad. Oh, yeah. No, I I mean, I have had tremendously strong, amazing, and supportive parents. I, my parents were really young, as, as you mentioned. My mom was 20 and my dad was 21 when they had me. You know, at the time that I was born, uh, you know, my mom was really sick. They almost lost her. They lost me, uh, almost lost me. And 
it, you know, it was, it was a mess. I was rushed to the NICU. I was in respiratory distress and the doctors gave a lot of grim prognoses and my mom didn't know what to make of it. And um, I'll never forget that the story that I was told is that when they were rushing me in the elevator in the neonatal transporter to uh, all children's hospital, my grandmother saw me for the first time, my mom's mom. And she said, there is nothing wrong with that child. She's going to be just fine, you know, and, and, you know, off they whisked me and, and, you know, we, we made it. And it wasn't until I was two that um, we had a diagnosis and um, wow. yeah. So my parents were just, they were told I had water on the brain, which essentially probably means hydrocephalus. And I had, um, you know, as a, as a physician now, I'm like trying to put the pieces together from, from my parents. And, you know, I, I, I definitely was a very sick baby, um, but I, uh, at two years age, went up to Johns Hopkins, a pedi my pediatrician in Orlando, because um, we moved from St. Pete to Orlando for my dad for an early job. He said, I'm going to send you up to the Moore Genetics Clinic uh, so that uh, they can figure out what's going on. And right away they knew. And I, you know, from there I had lots of surgeries so that I could get around and do the best I can. And my parents you know, they, I'm sure I can't even imagine how hard it was. My mom used to pass out after every surgery when she saw me for the first time. And Dr. Kopitz would always come with the smelling salts and ready to catch her. But, <laughs> but you know what? She did it. She made, she made all the trips to, to get me the best care possible. We're going to walk through that story just a little bit slower because a lot happened pretty quickly right there as you summed it up. You, you are born, your mother didn't know that there were any certain challenges that were going to be part of her baby's life. And they show up very quickly. You go to neonatal but eventually you come home without a diagnosis and you're living a pretty good life. And then at two, you finally get a diagnosis. What was that diagnosis? Yeah. So that diagnosis was a type of skeletal dysplasia uh, called spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Um, they weren't exactly sure. And to this day, I mean, I think um, a relatively rare type, we think it's type Strudwick, you know, it's, it's a type of uh, essentially dwarfism and it results in, you know, not only short stature, really, that's sort of the most minor of features. Right. Um, it's, it's, it results in a lot of orthopedic complications. So um, it's a, it affects the cartilage. So it may you know the way my bones grow, the way my joints are made. They just sort of have, you know, during all of my growth spurts, I just would become knock kneed and bent and scoliosis and cervical spine instability. So, you know, just any joint you can imagine is affected. And so, that was the diagnosis. And they showed my mom a lot of very scary pictures of kids and adults that had grown up without orthopedic care and how yes. um, debilitated they were. If they weren't paralyzed, that was pretty scary. Um, but I think we were extraordinarily fortunate that we found a surgeon early who early in his career, you know, when we found him, he was just chief of pediatric orthopedics at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And he decided uh, over the course of his career to dedicate his entire practice to caring for kids with skeletal dysplasias. Mm. Well, one of them is with me right now. And, and you got to know this physician very well. I understand you had, I think, three dozen surgeries as a, as a child and young person. For our listeners and viewers who may not know the types of surgeries and the reasons for them, would you just explain, like, give us the details of like, of like one. Why would they bring you in for anesthesia 36 different times? So it's a really, really complicated, but good question. Um, I think, you know, first of all, there are the things that they needed to do to prevent major harm, right? So um, because the uh, mutation affects all of your joints, my neck being unstable uh, was one of the first surgeries I had. So they had to essentially fuse it at C1, C2, which is right at the base of the skull. Because had I fallen even accidentally as a kid, I could have become paralyzed from the neck down. That was the first surgery. And that involved fusing it with bone and metal and then putting myself in a halo, which, you know, puts screws in your skull. And then, you know, you recover for, oh gosh, I don't even know how long I was in that. I was two, so I don't remember. Um, but it was a very long time. Yes. And then And then after that, you know, it was really to what we called tune-ups to align and straighten my lower limbs, hips, knees, and ankles, because um, as I would grow, they would become deformed to where the point where you wouldn't be able to walk if you didn't break the bone. So basically it was a series of osteotomies of um, all of my lower limbs where mm -hmm. they would break the bone, realign them, 
And then I'd recover in a, you know, like a hip spica, which comes up to your chest. Your legs are spread out. You're laying down for a good eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks um, in a cast, or it could just be a leg. If he did only operate on the knees and ankles, um, might be a full leg cast. Um, and then you'd go through physical therapy to learn to walk again after each summer of surgeries. And then, um, you know, I had my back because I my scoliosis as I hit puberty, got so bad that I couldn't breathe properly and bracing. We tried it for a year. It didn't work. So a lot of my surgeries were when you were growing. Thankfully, after college, um, the growth issues and the abnormalities in the way um, I was aligned stopped. So I don't have to have those anymore. But now I have degenerative joints. And so I've had my hips replaced. The knees are looking pretty bad. Ankles are looking pretty bad. None of my joints are normal. So right. we'll see what's next. You know, I'm not the only one picking up on this. You have joy in your voice. And as you and I were talking about beforehand, you're in pain. And life is hard. It's going to get harder. It's been extraordinarily difficult. So clearly today you're dealing with it as a child. What was that like for you? You mentioned, you know, every summer we'd go through the rounds of, of surgery and then the months of therapy. That's really hard. And you did it summer after summer after summer for a young, for, as a young person. What was that like for you as a kid? I, I think I'm fortunate in that my parents raised me to be really resilient and to count my blessings, but it was hard. I mean, I can tell you growing up, every surgery, I dreaded it. You know, imagine like you're going from Florida to Baltimore <laughs> and, you know, you're either in a car or a plane or a train. You know, we took all different routes to get there. I tried to ignore all of the fears until like it became the day before. Yeah. And then on top of that, my parents, we had a tradition. So we did something fun the night before surgery to, you know, or did something before surgery. Maybe it was a party or something. But I, I can tell you, as I got a little bit older and became more self-aware of mortality, I definitely thought, oh, this is the last one. I'm not going to survive this one. This is it, right? I I would sit in the pre-op area and then as they're putting me to sleep, think, I don't, I can't imagine my next birthday or I can't imagine graduating from eighth grade or I, if I couldn't imagine it, I was afraid it, that was because it wasn't going to happen. I wasn't going to make it through this one. Like how could someone live this many times and go through this? And of course, you know, that was aside from just worrying about the fact that I'm going to feel really crappy for the next couple of weeks uh, post-op. But I just knew I had to, if I could just survive the surgery, it would be okay. Mm. And um, I guess I'm really lucky that I, I made it through all of them. You have all these challenges, and you also mentioned the diagnosis of dwarfism. You're a little person. As a, as a young person in life, you still are. Talk about growing up in a community where you uh, not only go in for all these surgeries and then all the therapy that you've got to utilize to follow up so you can recover, but also going through life different than everybody else. I think life is hard enough when you're young and you fit in. Uh, you were different. And so talk about what that was like for you. For those of us that have various challenges, I think there's good and bad to it, right? There's always a silver lining. I think it made me probably more mature, uh, more driven for enjoying life when life was good. I think that it pushed me to work really hard in school because not one well, of my parents helped with that too, of course, but I, I knew that I wanted to when I wasn't having to have surgery or for the things that I could control, I wanted to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, I've got this one life, so I've got to make the most of it. And so I think that was the upside. The downside, of course, of, you know, growing up as a little person is that, you know, you get left out a lot. Um, you're constantly don't know if you can depend on friends. Are they going to be there during the bad times, like the good times, you know, you know, never dating, you know, all of those sort of social challenges were probably the hardest in high school. High school, for lack of a better word, pretty much sucked. I mean, I made the most of it, but I, I think, you know, I found some good friends in college and that was nice for a change and to feel like, you know, I had some, some people that I could just enjoy time with and not be worried you know, are they going to really want to hang out with me tomorrow if they're hanging out with me today? Um, but I, I think uh, the social implications of being a little person are, are pretty challenging. You get, you know, you get a lot of stares. I'm totally used to that. Probably made being public on television really easy <laughs> because I was always very really public no matter life. what. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Always everyone, everyone's always looking at you anyway. So <laughs> you, you've credited your parents both in your books and 
throughout various interviews that I've seen you on or heard you on, on how to equip you to not only be resilient, but to be um, to be accepting and loving of yourself and of others. So when my when I was a little boy growing up with some challenges, my mother and father reminded me that I'm as good as anybody else. And they gave me some specific cues around how to step forward. What were some directions or instructions or guidance that your parents gave you when someone stares at you, when you hear whispers, when you hear laughter, this is what you're supposed to do, Jennifer. What do they tell you you ought to do when you hear that kind of uh, that kind of stuff going on when you walk into a store or a schoolhouse? Oh my goodness. My parents probably mostly taught me empathy and to, to take this as an opportunity to educate. You know, they, um, they reminded me that how much I have to be thankful for. I, they really didn't let me have a lot of time to be down. Um, like if I would come home depressed because I went to a school dance and I never, you know, I, I felt very left out and lonely and didn't have a date. You know, my mom would remind me, oh, please. She's like, you are 14. She said, right. you're going to be just fine. All of those kids, sure, they may have, some of them may have a date. Not all of them do, I bet. So you're not the only one. And, you know, did you have a good time? And that's all that matters. And, you know, you got plenty of time for the other things. Um, so, you know, and my mom would just, you know, my parents remind me to, to count my blessings for all those that I, things that I did have. I had my brain, you know, I, I had a lot of, you know, I was a hard worker and, you know, I could accomplish almost anything I wanted. So they, they really did remind me of that and to not, um, sweat the small stuff. Um, I think the other thing when, you know, I would get made fun of, or people would stare, you know, my, my dad, he was a little bit of the jokester. He'd say, Oh, just tell him take a picture. It lasts longer, you know. And he tell me to <laughs> to make a joke if I'm feeling uncomfortable, and um, you know. And they just reminded me that they don't know. Just you know, if someone asks you why you're so short, or you know, if they say they call you the M word, you know, midget, just just say hey, you know, the nice person, and smile, and always be polite. Never be rude back. And you know, I I think that was good. I think it 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 helped me to not. Um, get too much of a chip on my shoulder and to be too angry about it because you can only yes. control so much, you know? Well, you, you keep going back to your work ethic, to your brain, to your your drive. I've heard from others that you are a force. Like, hey, do, do, do not be fooled by the smile and that joyful voice. This woman is a force. Well, part of that force threw yourself into studies. Uh, I, unfortunately, John O'Leary did not have that same force going through high school and college, which is why I'm not a medical doctor these days. I, after, hey, after, <laughs> after going through the treatments and the recovery, the last thing in the world as a young person I imagined doing was getting into healthcare. And I would imagine many folks who are spending a lot of their youth in hospitals run from them. You recognize the blessing of them and wanted to pour back into them. Talk to me a little bit about that. And then eventually where you went for college and what you studied. I think for me, because I spent so much time, you know, like you in the hospital, but I I ended up kind of finding it like a home away from home. Um, you know, I, I had close, you know, nurses that I kind of grew up with and my surgeon, I had the same surgeon all my life. And I think that longevity in those relationships helped me to feel like the hospital was a place where, you know, good things can happen. It's painful to be there. You don't want to be there, right. but if you got to be there, you can do it with really great people. And so I think that I had a comfort in the healthcare setting, in the hospital setting. Like it was like a place I knew. And right. I, I think that helped with the drive. And then I think I also, um, you know, I love, uh, I've always loved science and biology. And I actually, for a very long time, did, did not necessarily want to become a doctor. I wanted to become a marine biologist because um, I love I love the ocean. I grew up in Florida and it's just the other thing that makes me very happy. And so I uh, started studying at the University of Miami for undergrad and started going into marine science. And then I realized, hmm, I may not be as good at chemistry as I'd hoped. And, <laughs> and there's a lot of that in there. And then on top of it, I also realized I love people. I, yeah. I love science and biology, but I also love people. And I knew that marine science, more likely you're going to be in a lab doing research. And I tried it out and I was like, mm, you know, I'm much more of a social person. So um, that's where it kind of dawned on me that, you know, I really should combine this love of, of science with my love of people. And, you know, I could 
make a difference in kids' life the way I benefited? You know, can I do medicine? I didn't know anyone else who was a little person who was a doctor. And I can tell you, a lot of people told me that might not be the best choice. I mean, even my parents were worried about it for me. They, as much as they had pushed me to achieve and, you know, anything is possible, yes. they were worried because they, they knew how physically demanding it can be. Um, having seen my surgeon, you know, working 20 hours a day and rounding at midnight and just, you know, he'd come out of the OR after 10 hours of operating on me and look exhausted. You know, my parents were like, did you eat while you were in there? You know, and, and so I think they were really worried about that. But, but I, I said, you know what, I, I feel like I can do this. Let's just give it a try. I won't know unless I give it a try. So that's how I ended up uh, in medicine. So you gave it a try, but it's not like it came easy. And when I'm referring to that, it's not only the work and, and the effort required to graduate medical school and become a physician, getting into it is difficult, yeah. in particular when people don't give you an opportunity. Uh, my understanding is you applied to 30 different schools and only heard back from two, and it's not because of grades. If that's true, then what do you think it's based on? Uh, you know, I mean, there's no way to know 100%, but... Um, I, I, I know a lot of it's because of my physical disability, because of my stature. Um, you know, I, I had, I compared notes with all my close friends who were pre-med. I mean, similar grades, MCAT scores, activities, you know, and, and they were all getting interviews. I wasn't even getting interviews at the point of that second stage after you send the, um, the, uh, essay that says my history as a patient and my, admiration of my surgeon and how I wanted to give back um, in a way that I had benefited because I was here I was you know I was running around I was in college I was enjoying my life as to the fullest I could all because of the care that I'd gotten yeah and so I wanted to do the same for other kids in some way and you know I I didn't have any you know fantasy of necessarily becoming an orthopedic surgeon I mean I would have loved it but I I you know I knew that that was probably going to be a physically demanding field that might not be the most practical, but I, I thought I could do something in medicine. And unfortunately, in, back when you applied to medical school back then, you know, they said on the application, they have the right to, you know, not accept any applicant that they don't feel has the physical or uh, in mental capabilities, which at some level, I guess I get. But the problem is, is that by saying that, they were overlooking so many capable individuals that have so much to offer the field yes. um, because they were taking a, a very broad sweep versus an individual look at the person. And um, yeah, I, I didn't get interviews anywhere except for two places. And one of them was my dream school. And the other one was my soon to be alma mater. Right. Um, and that was only because I happen to, I think, know the president of the university who I think found out I didn't get an interview. I actually got rejected. And then I got an interview after that, after I shared that information with him, which, you know, was unsolicited, but he asked. And so I couldn't lie. And I, I told him, I was like, yeah, so Dr. Foote, sorry, I, I, I don't think I'm, you know, I'm not going to come here because I got rejected without an interview. And he's like, oh, really? He was like, that's surprising. And then, and then I got an interview. So, so there's so much there. Like, I look back at my physicians and when you are in and out of doctor's offices a lot, either because of my, my father today or some things that I went through with a, as a child or we go through now with our own children, my wife and I, it seems to me the doctors who have been through the most in their childhood are the most compassionate physicians we've met. And those who have been through perhaps a little bit less, at least on the surface, can uh, treat you more as a number than they can as a human being. And I think the more we treat the human being, the more successful the outcome of that person. So with you growing up with all of the challenges and still dealing with them in real time in college, with the essay that you would have written, for me, I would have thought it would have been a page turning type deal that would have encouraged somebody to pick up a phone and say, I've got to meet this woman. I've got to learn more about her story and see if we can get her to join us at school. Yeah, you know, it's... um. It's it's it is rather disheartening that in the field of medicine where, you know, back then and today, but back then there was just this sense that you had to be, I call it a pluripotent stem cell. It's like it's it's like you have to be capable of doing all fields of medicine to enter into medical school, which is in hindsight kind of crazy. Yeah. But but I, but that's that was the perception, right? You had to be fully healthy and strong to care for those that are sick. Meanwhile, 
if you've lived it, you're a better caregiver, Correct. right? I mean, what, it, it, it didn't make any sense. Um, and I think today things are slowly changing. They're getting better um, where we have so much more, I think, awareness. Um, but there was this sense of you have to be this healer, but the yeah. healer can't be someone who has healed themselves, which is crazy. Mm, well said. So before I, I start playing the violin too loudly, I want to make sure our listeners know where you went to where you went to a medical school. Johns uh, Hopkins. Yes, Johns yeah, Hopkins I mean, School of Medicine. On. Yeah, pretty world class. So, so talk about uh, when you found out that you were going to be interviewed, and ultimately you made it in, and and what that experience was like. Oh my goodness! Well, you know, because my first interview was at was at my, my, you know, that my soon to be undergraduate at the University of Miami. And that one was rather grueling. Um, I was very nervous about this interview. So I did not tell a soul that I was going there, um, except for my parents, because, well, they had to buy the plane ticket. So, <laughs> so I, 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 you know, and I had connections there. Now I hadn't, my, my surgeon had um, not worked at Johns Hopkins for about mm, 10 years, 10 plus years since I, you know, until what, till the time, you know, I went to interview. So I didn't still, I wasn't still a patient at Johns Hopkins then at the time. It'd been, you know, not since I was 12, but, you know, I had some connections. So I didn't tell anyone. And I went up there, I, I went on my interview. Um, I met with a pediatrician and, you know, it was honestly um, a very easy interview. Like he, you know, he asked me about my grades and my career aspirations and my activities and like the normal stuff, why I wanted to become a doctor and, you know, what areas I was thinking of going into um, and never once asked me about my stature. Whereas my previous interview had been all about my stature and how I was going to see patients and how I was going to be a trauma surgeon. And I was like, I'm not going to be a trauma surgeon, you know, I was right. thinking in my head, <laughs> but I didn't say that. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it was just, it was an hour of me defending my interest in going to medicine. And this one was almost too easy to where I thought, oh, they're totally being dismissive, right? They're just, you know, thankfully I got the interview, but it's probably not going well because they're afraid to ask me about my stature. So I started to bring it up and I, I had, you know, some ideas about how I would see patients with my step stool and use my scooter to get around the campus and all of that. And honestly, um, after that, it was so, it, he was like, yeah, that makes sense. He said, you know, if you need help when you're here, we can do something to support you. If you come here, just let us know. And, and that was it. And then I, I got accepted two weeks later, you know, it, it was four of the most amazing and toughest years of my life. I will tell you. So, talk, um, I've heard you say that before. Grueling is a word I've heard you use, use several times. And it, if I'm reading between the lines, it wasn't just the intellectual book side. When you use the word difficult or grueling, what, what are you referring to? Medical school is like a rite of passage, right? So there's definitely the intellectual piece and that's a ton of studying, lots of coffee, lots of late nights. Um, you know, it was, it was long hours catching babies on a step stool, like in my OBGYN retracting during my general surgery rotation. I, I literally would take, and, and I'm so thankful for the nursing team because they would, they would sterilely drape my three layered step stool contraption so that I was sterile getting up there and I could be at the site and I could do what every other med student did and retract the thyroid, which thyroid surgery of all of them, like the patients sitting upright. So they're higher than most. And so, you know, I was like really high. And I remember holding this thing like this. And I remember at one point, you know, Dr. Udelsman, I, he, you know, great endocrine surgeon, thyroid surgeon. I, I thought I was going to drop the retractor because my arm is going to like just collapsed on me. And he was, I said, I was like, do I interrupt? I'm a student. Like, what do I do? So I, I said, I'm sorry, Dr. Jusman. I said, you know, I think I need to switch hands. He was like, no, 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 you're great. Stay right there. I was like, oh my crap, please do not let me drop this in the middle of this person's surgery, this poor woman. And I did it. I made it like, I guess that's how they build you up. You know what I mean? They like make it tough. Like make it do it. Cause you know, a life's on the line and, and I did great. Yeah. So, but uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's memories like that, that I just think, I learned a ton. I learned how to be a good doctor. I knew how to, I learned how to be dedicated um, to, to, to put, you know, everybody else before yourself. Um, and, and, you know, it was tough, but I made it. I, you know, we could spend all day talking about work you know, or talking about uh, reality television. We'll talk about that momentarily, but speaking of love, eventually love is going to show up in your life. It, it, it kind of steps in and out of your life at various times with a fellow named Bill, but it's going to show up in a mightier way. Talk about Bill Klein 
when you uh, when you were finally in a place where you were ready to date him? Because I know you had some overlaps, but when did Bill show up at the right time? Ah, uh, yes, we we call it two ships passing in the night, the two of us. Um, yeah, you know, we we um, you know, we met when we were ten. I don't remember. I don't know if you want me to tell you that story. Um, we were in the hospital together, but um, and then our our surgeon and um, our surgeon's nurse practitioner Diane tried to set us up when we were in college, but we never met. I was too busy going to school, you know, and and working hard, and you know, to find to reach out to somebody. Um, I just. I just didn't. And then one day um, with a glass of wine to my best friend, I went on a dating site <laughs> called uh, datealittle.com and it really does exist. And uh, I said, all right, I'm going to search a 500 mile, 500 mile pro like radius. And I'm going to find one guy to send an email to. And she went on match.com and she found one guy much closer. I ended up, um, emailing this guy named Bill Klein. I didn't realize who it was at the time. I uh, sent him a random email. Hey, have we met at a little people's conference? I mean, I hadn't been to many, but I'd been to a few. I'm like, what do you say to somebody you don't know? Another little person who's, you know, in New York. And I was in Pittsburgh at the time and ended up um, sending him this email. He wrote me back. He revealed to me on our first phone call that he did know who I was and he'd been following my career. And I thought, oh God, I... I have found a stalker. Um, <laughs> you know, what luck is that, right? And um, this is before social media, right? And everything. And so long story short, um, you know, he 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 revealed to me that we met when we were 10 and he had uh followed, you know, been heard about me through our surgeon. He also wanted to go into medicine at one point. He's smarter. He went into business. So, you know, I always, um, you know, he's the brainiac in the family, to be honest. And, um, and he, uh, you know, we never really officially met until then. And mm. so, of course, after that, I called our nurse practitioner, Diane, and got a background check and made sure he was okay. <laughs> and she said, absolutely okay. And confirmed that it was the guy that, you know, she had tried to set us up with. And uh, honestly, we talked for a good month on the phone. Um, before I started falling asleep on him because, you know, I was a, I was a fellow working hundred hours a week in neonatal intensive care. And so he finally said, I've got to come see you. And so we planned the, the free weekend, you know, when you're on, when you're in training, you get a golden weekend every month, that's your only weekend off. And so I, um, I said, well, this month it's my birthday weekend is my golden weekend. And my friend, my best friend, who was the one that I had also you know, reached out to him with a glass of wine at the same time with is throwing me a birthday party. And I said, you can come, but you're going to meet like 40 of my friends all at once. And he's like, all right, I can handle it. And he did. And he did great. We had um, sushi the night before. We never ate a bite. We just talked and talked and talked. And it was like, we knew each other forever. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I feel like we just, we were meant to be. And he's the love of my life. He's my best friend. I'm glad you married your best friend. I'm glad you your your paths crossed again after crossing several times before that. You're going to say the words I do, and then you're going to get some unusual opportunities in your life. And I'd just like to go through a few of them quickly. Reality television. You don't strike me as the type of woman who seeks to become a reality television star. And you're nodding your head like, no, not at all. But no. you do. Like, <laughs> but you I know. did it. So like talk about the opportunity and then ultimately why say yes to it? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, I still look back and I'm like, how did that happen? But, you know, it did. And <laughs> um, I guess life is full of surprises and that's what makes it so great. Um, you know, we, um, so the, the, how it all began actually is when I uh, moved to Long Island for my first attending job. I was, uh, I, I started off as a neonatologist at Stony Brook because Bill was from Long Island. He had his own you know, company. So I had, after I graduated from my training, I had the opportunity to move. So I lucked out with a great job there and we were planning our wedding. And that's when Good Morning America was doing a little, like a, a segment on women with skeletal dysplasias who had professional careers. And oh. I, I think Little People of America had reached out, had sent them my way. They said, oh, there's this woman, Jennifer Arnold. She's a physician, might be someone you could reach out to. So they did. They called me at work. 
Good Morning America did. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to do it. I'd done little things in the press before, raising awareness, you know, just random stuff, mostly local. And I was like, sure, I'll be happy to do that for the news. It sounds like a positive piece. So they did the, they did the episode aired. And then um, afterwards, a producer who saw it from um, our, who became our production company, called me and actually asked if I'd be interested in filming our wedding. Because at the end of the segment, they said, oh, you know, and Dr. Arnold's engaged to Bill Klein. They're planning their, their wedding. Well, we turned them down. We said, mm, I, I talked to them and there was like, it sounded sensational. They're like, we want to see how you get your dress altered and how you're going to like do this and do that. And I was like, it's all about the size. And I'm like, I have no problem cover, covering the size thing, but that's not what my life is about. And it just didn't seem, it seemed like a lot of work for really not a lot of benefit. It was very educational. Yeah. So we turned them down and they said, well, can we keep talking to you? And they came back with a couple of other pitches and we turned them down a couple of times, actually. And over the course of a year, um, they finally came back and they said, well, would you consider doing a, a re, like a, a, a series pitch like on your life? It's like, a what? <laughs> and they said, well, we, it's, you know, reality show following your life. We think you have a great story. And that was really nice. It was very, um, you know, it was very humbling that they thought we had a good enough story to cover. And at that same time, Little People, Big World had just come out and I hadn't even watched the show yet, but I'd heard about it. And while we were discussing and thinking about this other opportunity, um, I actually, this is a story I've shared this before, but it's, it's, it's a true story. A, a little girl came up to me while I was shopping in Long Island in Bed Bath and Beyond. And she said, oh, so nice to meet you. You're a little person like Little People, Big World. Wow. And that was the first time a kid had called me little person without like having already known another little person in their life. Right. Yes. At least that I could tell. And so, and I figured out that she learned it from that show. And I thought, Oh, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do this. It's that show is making a difference already. Maybe this is an opportunity we shouldn't like just dismiss. So we agreed to give it a try and it was just going to be a pilot. We filmed the <laughs> pilot. I thought one and done, right. Bill literally was post-op two days when it aired from his hip replacement surgery. And so I remember being, and we were in the process of moving to Texas already at this point. So we were like in, in his house, in our house, our house at the time we were married. Um, and it, it was on the market and we'd gotten all of our furniture out already. And we were in like the one little room that he'd saved like a microwave and a bed because he was commuting back and forth for work still. And he was like on lots of pain medication, slept through most of the episode and we watched it. And I think at the end we were just like, okay, that wasn't too terribly embarrassing. It's over. Right. We'll, we'll see what happens. And then next thing you know, like it gets picked up for season one. And, you know, every season the producers were like, the production company's like, this never happens. Right. Like <laughs> it just keeps going. And it was only the two of us for many years. So um and we just, we somehow fit it into our lives, but we tried to make sure, and it was a constant battle, that it was not sensational. We yes. were not, and if it got canceled <clears throat> because of it, so be it, you know, we had too much to lose. There's so much that comes out of that for the viewers. Like you you are helping shape those who are tuning in uh, with every every episode, every season, I think 14 seasons, is that right? Yeah. 14 seasons, it's an unbelievable run. Uh, what was the hardest part of doing that work? Because it is work. It might, they might put the quotation reality television, but the reality is this is work. So what's the hardest part of, of reality TV? Yeah, it definitely is work. And um, you, you said it like, because we used to, we, well, first we thought, oh, you're going to watch us like just do our yeah. work. And, you know, Bill's going to be working on his computer and I'm going to be going to the hospital. You know, No, 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 it's not that. Because, um, you know, every time you cover something, you can't do it again. So you got to keep, creating content. Um, I think the hardest part was just time schedule um, because we both did have full-time careers and we had to fit this in. Um, but we got pretty creative and we had a great production team. I mean, our executive producer became like family. So, and, and to be honest, I could never have done this myself without um, a partner. And Bill was so good at, you know, sort of navigating the creative piece, making it work. He would spend the time, you know, um, with the producer, you know, he and I would talk at night and then yeah. he would translate during the day and then they would come up with a plan. And then I just had to show up and, you know, but we, we only filmed about on average 
probably two days a week. So our seasons were nine months to, to, to create one season, which is hard on a production company. Um, I know, but somehow we made it work and we had a, a great team, but the hardest part was time. I mean, I'll never forget, like, I'll just give you an example why it's so hard. I mean, I was on call. This is when, you know, we were in Texas. I was at Texas Children's and I had lost a baby at seven in the morning. You know, I was, it was, I was on all night. Unexpected delivery came in very, very critically ill baby. I mean, we, we resuscitated for a very long time in the delivery room. And unfortunately there's nothing we could do. And I had to go home after that morning, which of course I came home really late because, you know, that had all happened in the wee hours of the morning at, you know, when I was trying to get off my shift and, um, and I had to like, go be happy and go do like an anniversary cooking thing with Bill. And it was just for whatever reason, that, that was one of the hardest moments to film. And I, I, I yeah, there just, there were more than days like that, you know, when you're sort of got all that other stuff going on and you can't, you can't bring it to TV because they weren't there. So, um, you just have to kind of pick yourself up and keep going and, you know, at least it made life interesting and we always had fun things to look forward to. But um, I think the time piece and the exhaustion piece was probably the hardest. You mentioned years earlier that you were in Long Island at Bed Bath & Beyond. So apparently the, the episode is being brought to you today, listeners, by Bed Bath & Beyond. So there you go. Uh, but you have had people come up to you nonstop now for the last 15 years or so, as long as the show has been rolling out there and, and you've been known is there a favorite story? I know you've got countless stories of people approaching you, letters you've received, phone calls you've received, but is there, is there a favorite story where you're like, you know what, maybe, maybe it's all, all of this work. Maybe it's for this one person. Ah, that's a great question. Um, the people that I've met that have made the most lasting impression. Um, I think it's been the families that I've feel like we've touched with our program because of Adoption, yeah. cancer, or disability. There's one young girl that I met who had major medical challenges and, you know, um, disability. And she uh, she reached out to me and she actually uh, spent a day with me at the hospital because um, she, you know, watched on the show and she wanted to go into medicine. And um, she said she was inspired to do it because. Um, because she had seen that I could do it on, on my show. And so she's still in college right now. So I don't know if she'll, uh, what, what will come become of her, but I know she will do amazing things because I have never met a woman with more drive and more passion for taking care uh, of others. And yet she's been a patient all of her life. So I think it's, it's, it's really those that have told me that watching the show help them get through a tough time or help them to not be afraid to go for what they want to achieve yes. in life. That has meant the most to me. You, you gave us three big groups. I'd like to go through those three groups uh, because all three matter so much. Let's begin with adoption. Will, you, you mentioned earlier about Bill, what a great gift it was to have a partner going through this. Well, now the partnership agreement has grown a little bit when Will shows up in your life. Talk about the joy of raising Will. Oh my goodness. Will has just been a light of our life. He is always happy. He's charming. He's the kindest soul I've ever met. And, um, you know, we, we, we found Will through rainbow kids. Um, you know, we, we knew we wanted to adopt actually, <laughs> technically we signed up to be on a wait list for adoption before we were married. <laughs> it's one way to date your, your, your future spouse. Right. Be like, Hey, you know, this wait list, I heard it takes six years to, to, to get us. Can we sign up even though we're not married yet? And, you know, he's like, okay. Um, <laughs> and, but, but, you know, I, I knew, I, I always knew I wanted to adopt whether or not we had a child biologically great, but I knew I wanted to adopt another little person and um, he was supportive of it. And so when we became serious and we like, you know, went, did all the homework that you need to do and the home studies, all that, I mean, we, we found Will and, I think we were scared to pieces to become parents. I mean, he made us, he made us parents. And, uh, yeah. but, but the, raising him has been nothing but a joy. He, um, I'll tell you the first time we met him in China, we walked into, he was in like in a, in his foster facility. And I walked in while he was in with his therapist doing some speech therapy, Bill and I, and he looked up 
and he said, Mama Baba. <laughs> you, ha- as I say this, I'm trying not to cry. The tears just like, I was like, I was like done. I was like, oh my God, this is like insane. He doesn't even met us yet. He's already calling us Mama Baba. And it was, it was it. He was, he was ours from the, from, from that moment on meant to be. Oh, how old was he when you got him? Three. He was three. Three years old. Just turned three. Do you celebrate his birthday or the day you got him day? And and w- to which degree is the, the the one where he wears the golden crown even higher than the other one? <laughs> we celebrate both. Um, he probably does get more presents and traditional like party stuff on his birthday, but it's family time on on his his gotcha day. And um, yeah, his gotcha day, he always gets something special. We always feed him whatever he wants. He is a lover of food. Um, so it's 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 usually Chinese food and usually not always. Either we go out to a really nice place or I have to cook, which is ooh, I try my best um to make authentic um inner Mongo- you know, Mongolian uh dishes like hot pots and things. But he honestly, he he celebrates both and he loves to watch his video. We play his song. He has a song um, that our producer's husband wrote just for that episode. And that is, that's his song. And um, it's, it's just, he's, he's known in the orphanage as being the baby whisperer because Mm. he cared for babies. And he is to this day, a caretaker. He'll come up, give me a hug. If he sees me stressed out, he, you know, he's now a preteen and he just hugs me and is like, mom, it's okay, mom. <laughs> he's like got a deep voice. I'm like, what happened to my baby? But you know, it's all good. Well, your baby has a baby sister. So uh, as we move through adoption, talk about Zoe. I can't let you brag on one without bragging on both. Oh no, I have to brag on both. Zoe is also the other light of our life. And she is the one that keeps us on our toes. Um, you know, we brought home Zoe at two. And she, you know, she, she came to us from India and she honestly um, had probably a a more challenging circumstance, um, you know, before we got her, she was failure to thrive, um, pretty, pretty malnourished, um, pretty, had a lot of challenges and she struggled when we brought her home. I mean, she was what you hear about more commonly in terms of having difficulty with attachment and trauma. And so, um, you know, there was, it was, it was hard because she cried a lot and all we wanted to do was love her and and help her to feel safe. And, but at two, what could she understand? And so um, she has just blossomed though, into this amazingly bright, spunky, um, so strong willed young lady that no one is ever going to put Zoe in a corner. And I am thankful <laughs> for that because she is just the most resilient young lady ever. And she's my, she's like my bestie. So she likes the ocean like me. She loves art like me. She, uh, she likes horses. I don't like horses. I mean, I like horses, but I'm not an avid horse person, but that's her thing. And I'm just trying to embrace and support all of her growth. Um, because she is just such a vibrant, funny, and like, just, I don't know how to describe it, leader. She's a leader. She's going to take over the world one day. I have no doubt. So um, the two of them, they are like best buds and they are, they're our babies. And it's been a privilege and humbling to, to be a part of, of raising them, you know, but I can't take the credit. Your sure. voice changed. It, it, it's always been joyful this entire conversation, but when you began talking about Will and then Zoe, it, it elevated even more so. So clearly they are <laughs> light to you. They are brilliant. They are beautiful. And you're an awesome parent. And in the middle of all this joy comes another storm on the horizon. You, you mentioned three groups, adoption. There it is. You also said cancer. You're part of that group now. So talk about the, the diagnosis of cancer and to the degree uh, of like some of the challenges you faced and ultimately what, what got you through it? Yeah, you know, I mean, who would have thought that after, you know, all of the um, orthopedic challenges I've had in my life that I would have cancer? Like, I really kind of thought in the back of my mind, oh, I'm not going to get that one, right? Like, you know, I've had enough. Like, what are the chances, the odds? Well, just like anyone, you can get it. And and I did. Um, yeah, it honestly came at probably one of the most craziest times ever. Um, you know, the adoption process for Zoe um, was 
was hard because, you know, going through India, it was, it was a little less, um, what's the word, um, straightforward as it was with China. And so there were times when we very much feared we were not going to be able to bring Zoe home. And that was extraordinarily stressful. And then we went, we got approval, we were going to India, and I got sick. And it turns out that I had, well, I knew I had accidentally gotten pregnant of all things after bringing Will home. You know, you hear these stories, right? It's really true. <laughs> People go through infertility and adoption, and then they accidentally get pregnant. Well, I did. Um, but it, it was a completely non-viable uh, baby. And so I had a DNC and I was completely recovering from that. And I thought everything was fine. Well, we went to India um, maybe two weeks after my, or three to four weeks. I'm trying to remember the timeline. No, three to four weeks after my DNC. And then I started having major bleeding, major bleeding. I had to tell her how much. And she was like, Jen, you need to come home. She's like, you do not want a blood transfusion in India if you can avoid it. And um, it was that bad. So I ended up um, leaving Bill uh, and the and our kids and with our nanny. Thankfully, we had a nanny to help. But um, I, I actually said to Bill, I was like, so we can't take Zoe out of the country yet. But I also... I could, I should take Will with me, right? So that you don't have like two kids by yourself. Like this is a lot going on. And he was like, um, and what happens when you pass out on the plane and Will's by himself? And I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's not a good idea. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to leave. Um, but he was like, I need you for the rest of my life. So you need to go home. Mm. And um, I signed over power of attorney, left them in India. I went, you know, I, I went, um, we knew that, I mean, I needed to be there for the first couple of days because it was a very good chance that they would not have even given us Zoe had they, you know, not had I left sooner or not been there as the mom. And so, um, so I went home, my parents picked me up in Texas, went to the hospital, got evaluated, figured out I already had stage three choriocarcinoma. Um, I had to get a blood transfusion immediately, started chemo immediately, um, all in one same day that I landed. And um, I mean, thankfully, like, I guess it, that's some of the benefit of working at the hospital that you're cared for. Like they took really good care of me and I got treated right away, but um, it was a pretty, pretty rough time. So I went through um, six rounds of chemotherapy and a hysterectomy because I wasn't responding to chemo um, originally in, you know, immediately bringing Zoe home. Bill, I mean, there are pictures that I wish I could share with you of Bill, like not sleeping, <laughs> um, you know, trying to get through. He, you have, there are these certain stages that you have to go through for international adoption. And after you get the medical checks and you get your passport photos, then you have to get your TB test, which you have to wait for three days to make sure that's cleared. And, and I remember he was waiting for the final documentation and you have to drop off all your paperwork at the consulate. And, and then they just say, come back. We'll, we'll contact you in a couple of days. He was like, no. I am not leaving. He stayed till the lights were out with like with our bodyguard, my screaming daughter, my son and our nanny, like, you know, in this consulate until the lights went out. They're like, uh, sir, you need to go home. He's like, I'm waiting to see if you have my paperwork. And they were like, okay, let me go check. They were like, oh my gosh, this is weird. And they gave it to him same day so that he could get out of there as soon as possible. And he, uh, you know, he, he came home and, and, you know, the silver lining of all of that hardship um, you know, going through cancer and everything is that I actually got more time off from work mm. because, and I got to bond more with my kids. And it was in many respects, a beautiful time because I, I thought I could work for a while, but then I realized I couldn't, it, it really hit me hard, but it was, it was just family time, nothing else. And a little bit of chemo mm. <laughs> for, for about four months. I mean, yeah. here you are laughing about it, but stage three, you're leaving India, you're, you're about to adopt your second child. There's so much complexity and challenge and, and sadness to all of this. And yet you see the silver lining somehow in all of this. And it's remarkable. And it's one of the reasons why for 14 seasons, people have been tuning in. And I, I think maybe they, they tune in the first time to see how little people operate in life, but it's not why they tune back in. So I, I think that's commendable and remarkable and, and I admire it. So it brings us to the third group you mentioned, the group who are struggling, um, which is, it turns out every one of my listeners <laughs> and every one of your patients and their patients' families and every doctor you've worked alongside of and every Uber driver who's 
driven you down the road. Like everybody's got these struggles. So for those of us right now in the middle of the storm, you keep going back to the, the, the silver lining that there's always something on the horizon. But for those of us who do not currently see that or feel it, what's the encouragement or advice you, you would give us? Ah, uh, you know, I, I think the best advice I have is that you, you can't control the bad things that are going to come your way. Um, my aunt, who I was very close with as well, who was also very instrumental in raising me, both my aunts, you know, she always told me that you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to them. And, you know, I, I, as wish, I can wish as much as I want if I'm tall or I don't have to have surgery or didn't have cancer. I can't make that go away. But I can try to make the most of it because what's the alternative, right? If I let it get, to, I mean, I'm not going to say I don't have bad days. There are days I cry. There are days that I'm angry and frustrated. But if I let that last or if I let that linger, the only person I'm hurting is myself. Hmm. And I, I want to, I get this one life and I want to enjoy it. I want to make the most of it. And so I hope that others can see that, you know, life can be really tough and you, you're going to have tough times. We all are, but that if you can just, if we can, if we make it through it, which obviously that's the goal and there's no guarantees, but if we make it through it, then there are better things to look forward to. And that's the part of life that's worth living and worth living for. And so, um, I just, I, I always try to hang on to that when I'm having a really bad day because, um, you know, you don't get a second chance. So you just got to hang in there, ride the waves um, and hope that you can make it to another calm spot and you may get more waves again, but there's always going to be a calm spot to, to look forward to. Well said, Dr. We wrap up every single podcast with seven questions that tether all of our beautiful healing physicians and thought leaders and authors and friends together. So question number one for you is what is the most impactful book or most inspirational book you've ever read? Ooh, okay. So my ins most inspirational book um, is probably The Color Purple. It means a lot to me and my family. Um, so I love that book. But I would say one that kind of got me through some really difficult times. It's a cancer book and it's called... Um, my crazy, sexy cancer journey, I think. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's hilarious. So um, reading something fun when times are really bad is good. <laughs> What's one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a little kid that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? Something that I wish. I used to be really good at having much more imagination. And I used to come up with some crazy ideas. And I feel like because I'm going, going too much, too busy, I've lost some of that creative imagination. So I wish I was more imaginative than I used to be, as I used to be. Interesting, because I know how creative you are. So I'm, I'm amazed to imagine what it would have been like for you as a kid. It must have been really <laughs> out there. So question number three is this. If your home caught fire and all living things, Will and Bill and Zoe and all the pets, they're all out safely, but you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, one thing. What would you race in and save? Uh, my photo albums. My memories. Yep. If I could carry them, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> grab your favorite one, I guess. I guess so. I'd be like trying to drag the whole box out. <laughs> If yeah. you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anybody living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? Ooh, okay. I would like to talk to Albert Einstein. I'd just love to see what he's like, how he thinks, his perspective. Just, I've always admired him. That would be pretty amazing. It, it blows my mind to think that the stuff he thought of were proving true 80 years after. Like, right? how is that possible? I know, I know. I, I just, it intrigues me. It's a, it's, it's fat. It's, it's amazing. It's just, yeah, I can't imagine. Well, what's how the best advice things? Einstein or your parents or Bill or anybody else that you respect ever gave you? So the best advice you've ever received is. 
probably from my parents, um, a little bit of what we've said a little bit already, but I have a lot to be thankful for. So to remember that when the times are tough and not to let, you know, let everything completely, um, you know, dismay me to the point where I'm paralyzed. Um, I think the other piece of advice too, I'll just share this as well, which always for whatever reason sticks in my head funny because it it's it's it just it's easy to remember. My mom always told me because she was she was a waitress much of her life. She said, you need to use your brain, not your brawn. And so she really encouraged me to work really hard in school. Well done. If you could go back to school age 20, what wisdom or advice would you give yourself then? So looking back at your own life, what would you whisper to yourself at age 20? Uh, I, I would whisper to myself that it does get better. And, you know, there's a lot of really exciting things yet to come. So just hang in there. When I, I read in your book, your your husband at age 20 almost took his own life on, you know, on the, the dorm room, ready to leap and, um, uh, he needed the reminder that it's going to get better and you needed the reminder that it's going to get better. And I think it's a message. Every one of our listeners need to be reminded of from time to time that as difficult as this day is, it is going to get better. Yes. Yes. It, it, you know, I, I am so thankful that my husband didn't take that leap. I would never have my best friend. Mm. I would not have the life that I have. I would never have had a partner to get through cancer and kids and work and television and anything like he's just my rock. And, um, thank goodness he, he realized that it it is going to get better. And, um, I think for all of us, it's hard sometimes to see that it can get better depending on where your situation is. But when it's really bad like that, for me, the other thing that I think about is that, well, if I were to end it, there's no coming back. I have eternity to be dead. So I'm just going to get through this and hope that it gets better. And Mm -hmm. it always does. Dr. Jennifer Arnold, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? She gave it her all and loved every minute of it. Dr. Jennifer Arnold most certainly gave it her all. She loved almost every minute of it. And we certainly have loved every minute of her being on our program today. Doctor, I want to thank you again for making time, for being a role model for not only 14 seasons of television, but for a lifetime where people weren't watching you on TV, but they were observing what heroism and courage and love and faithfulness looks looks like in action. Thank you so much, John. You also have an amazing story and it inspires so many. So it is quite humbling and, and just, it's been so fun to get to talk with you today. Thank you for having me. Well, my friends, that is Dr. Jennifer Arnold. My name is John O'Leary and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. I love the joy in her heart. I love her awe. I love her optimism. I love her courage. I love her grace. I love the way Jennifer shows up and exudes life with every challenge she faced, including her struggles with cancer, infertility, adoption, and simply living her life in a challenging world. She remains steadfast in making this world, our world, a better place through her encouragement, through her education, through her love. My friends, if you enjoyed today's conversation, you are going to love the conversation that I had with my girlfriend. She is awesome. Her name is Ketchy Akwuchi. Like Jennifer, Ketchy reminds us of the ability we have to choose the path going forward regardless of the obstacles we faced. In one of the most heroic conversations we've ever had on the Live Inspired Podcast channel, Ketchy shares the story of growing up, a plane crash that changed everything, the scar she still bears, and the voice that reminds others of the possibility in their lives. It's an awesome, awesome story. Beautiful life. If you want to hear more about Catchy, check it out. Episode 466. I'll also have a link to it in our show notes. You can learn more about both by visiting me at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. My friends, I want to thank you for being part of our Live Inspired community. I want to thank you for uh, tuning in, for making a difference. I want to thank you for checking us out over the holidays. I want to wish each and every one of you a Merry Christmas. And I want to remind you of something our guest today reminded us. 
The foundation is firm. The challenges are real. And the best is still yet to come. So for this time, and until next time, my name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. You know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at keeleycompanies.com.